critic of cognitive psychology. The therapeutic techniques derived from cognitive and cognitive behavioral theory are practical and effective and can be self-administered by client under the direction of a therapist. These therapies have been established to record in changing problem behaviors such as phobias, obsessions and compulsions and in stress management. They also make a contribution in the treatment of depression and schizophrenia, though whether the treatment result is more effective than other interventions is inconclusive in literature. Furthermore, cognitive theory is criticized as being unscientific, as are psychoanalytic and humanistic theories, because mental process cannot be objectively observed and subjective reports are not necessarily reliable. Additionally, the insight that one's thinking is the cause of one's problem will not in itself bring about the behavior change. Finally, contrary to the proposal that thoughts influence feelings, which in turn influence behavior, a notion that underpins the cognitive approach, research conducted by Kearns and Gardner into procrastination and motivation among postgraduate university students suggests that if the behavior is changed first, that is, the student starts working on their study, then the student will feel more motivated and procrastination will be reduced. These findings can be explained by the relational model of Ivy and Zalaquet, in which thoughts, feelings, and behavior interact with each other and with meaning. In contrast to the linear unidirectional explanation of cognitive psychology, the thrust of the interactive model is that a change in any one part of the system may result in a change in other parts as well. So while cognition play an integral part in behavioral outcomes, they may not necessarily be the initiating factor as proposed by cognitive theory. Humanistic psychology Following this enchantment with the existing psychological theory of the time, Charlotte Puchler, Abraham Maslow, and Carl Rogers and their colleagues in the United States established the Association for Humanistic Psychology in 1962. Humanistic psychology has its intellectual and social roots in philosophy called humanism and existentialism, which brought psychology back to a close relationship with philosophy. This school of psychology, which became known as the Third Force, arose in response to dissatisfaction at the time with the mechanistic approach of psychoanalysis and behaviorism and the negative views of humankind that were implicit in both these theoretical perspectives. Humanist psychologists objected to the determinism of the two prevailing theories, psychoanalysis with its emphasis on unconscious drives and behaviorism which saw the environment as central in shaping behavior. Human psychology rejected the reductionism of explaining human behavior, feelings, thinking, and motivation merely in terms of psychological mechanisms or biological processes. It also opposed the mechanistic approach of behaviorism and psychoanalysis for the way in which they minimize human experience and qualities such as choice, creativity, and spontaneity. Humanistic psychologists focused on the intrinsic human qualities of individual, such as free will, altruism, self-esteem, freedom, and self-actualization, qualities which, they asserted, distinguished humans from other animals. Humanistic psychology therefore differed from its predecessors in its emphasis on the whole person, human emotions, experience, and the meaning of experience, the creative potential of the individual, choice, self-realization, and self-actualization. The theory also opposed dualistic, subject, object mind, body split, deterministic, reductionistic, and mechanistic explanations of human behavior. Humanistic movement also reflected a historical trend in Western industrialized cultures at the time, namely an interest in the worth of the individual and the meaning of life, and to be concerned about the rise of bureaucracy, the threat of nuclear war, the growing emphasis on scientific, positivist paradigms, alienation of the individual and consequent loss of individual identity in mass society. This led to humanistic psychology being aligned with the philosophical school of existentialism, 
as well as being associated with the human potential movements of the 1960s and the 1970s. The legacy of which can be seen today in individual and group counseling approaches. Humanistic psychology also played a part in the growing interest in qualitative research methods that seek to understand the experience of the individual and the meaning of the experience, such as phenomenology. The following people were prominent figures in the development of humanistic psychology. Charlotte Bühler Bühler, 1893-1974, distinguished her theory from Freudian psychoanalysis with the thesis that development was lifelong, goals were personally selected, and that the individual was searching for meaning in life beyond their own existence. She maintained that self-fulfillment was the key to human development and that this was achieved by living constructively, establishing a personal value system, setting goals and reviewing progress to thereby realize one's potential. Throughout the lifespan, according to Bühler, individuals strive to achieve four basic human tendencies, which are to satisfy one's need for sex, love and recognition, engage in self-limiting adaptation in order to fit in, belong and feel secure, express oneself through creative achievements, uphold and restore order so as to be true to one's values and conscience. Carl Rogers Rogers, 1902-1987, proposed a more hopeful and optimistic view of humankind than that of his psychoanalytic and behaviorist contemporaries. He believed that each person contained within themselves the potential for healthy, creative growth. According to Rogers, the failure to achieve one's potential resulted from constricting and distorting influences of poor parenting education or other social pressure. Client-centered therapy is the counseling model that Rogers developed to assist the individual to overcome these harmful effects and take responsibility for their life. Abraham Maslow As a frequently cited author in the healthcare literature, Maslow, 1908-1970, is renowned for his theory of human needs. Maslow, like Bühler and Rogers, premise is theory on the notion that human beings are intrinsically good and that human behavior is motivated by a drive for self-actualization or fulfillment. Maslow Maslow identifies three categories of human need. 1. Fundamental need Physiological Hunger, thirst and sex Safety, security and freedom from danger 2. Psychological need Belongingness and love, connection with others to be accepted and to belong. Self-esteem, to achieve, to be competent, gain approval and recognition. 3. Self-actualization needs, to achieve one's innate potential. Typically, Maslow's needs are represented in a hierarchical pyramid with fundamental needs at the base of the triangle and self-actualization at the top. Although Maslow did not describe his model in this way, nor did he suggest that progression through the hierarchy was in one direction, ascending, as his model is often depicted. For example, one may have a positive sense of self-esteem needs met, but be vulnerable regarding safety needs during a natural disaster like tsunami. Critic of humanistic psychology Intuitively, humanistic psychology appeals as a positive, optimistic view of humankind with this focus on personal growth, not disorder. However, this can also be a criticism in that, as a theory, humanistic psychology is a naive and incomplete. If humans are driven by a need to achieve their best, and to live harmoniously with others as Bühler, Rogers, and Maslow suggest, how does this account for disturbed states like depression and antisocial behavior like assault? Humanistic concepts can be difficult to define objectively, thereby posing a challenge for scientific investigation of the theory. Finally, there is little recognition of unconscious drives in explaining behavior, which limits the ability of the theory to contribute to an understanding of abnormal, deviant, or antisocial behavior. Eclectic approach. An eclectic or holistic approach is used in both psychological research and clinical practice. For example, 
initially Seligman's theory of learned helplessness to explain depression was underpinned by cognitive principle. However, as Seligman broadened this theory to seek explanations for happiness and well-being, and to establish a branch of psychology, which he called positive psychology, he integrated theoretical principles from cognitive psychology, for example, focus on strengths, setting of achievable goals, humanistic psychology, for example, the seeking of meaning, and sociology, for example, the importance of relationships. Joseph, an advocate of such an approach, states, the convergence of interest between humanistic and positive psychology promises to provide new avenues for research and theories development. Furthermore, in healthcare practice settings, biomedical and psychological interventions are frequently used concurrently to achieve better outcomes, as demonstrated in the following research focus. Research focus. Abstract. Background. Clinical guidelines recommend the combination of pharmacotherapy and psychotherapy for treating chronic depression, although there are only a few studies supporting an additive effect of psychotherapy. Methods. 45 inpatients with a chronic major depressive disorder were randomized to five weeks of either interpersonal psychotherapy, IPT, modified for an inpatient setting, 15 individual and 8 group sessions, plus pharmacotherapy or to medication plus clinical management, CM. The 17 item Hamilton rating scale for depression was the primary outcome measure. The study included a prospective naturalistic follow-up 3 and 12 months after discharge. Results. Intent to treat analysis revealed a significantly greater reduction of depressive symptom as well as better global functioning of patients treated with IPT compared with the CM group at week 5. Response and sustained response rates differed significantly between the two treatment conditions, favoring the IPT group. Remission rates were considerably higher for IPT patients who completed the treatment, 67% compared with 32. Patients who initially responded to IPT exhibited greater treatment gains at 12 months, since only 7% of these subjects relapsed compared with 25 of the CM subjects. In the long term, additional IPT led to a lower symptom level and higher global functioning. Limitations. The study uses data of a subset patients from a larger trial. Both treatment groups did not receive comparable amounts of therapeutic attention. Extrapolating the data from this inpatient study to chronically depressed outpatient may not be possible. Conclusions. Intensive common treatment provides superior acute and long-term effects over standard treatment in chronically depressed inpatients. Sociological theories. Sociological and psychological theories differ in that sociological theories do not seek explanations for individual behavior. Rather, they examine societal factors for their influence on the behaviors of its member. Sociologists propose that the origin of behavior, both normal and abnormal, lies not in the individual's mind, but in the broader social forces of the society in which the individual lives. For example, demographic factors for which patterns of mental illness are observed include age, the elderly are more likely to suffer from depression, gender, the suicide rate for men is higher than for women, although the rate for attempted suicide is higher for women than for men, socioeconomic status, poverty is associated with poorer physical and mental health outcomes, marital status, Depression and alcohol problem are two to three times more prevalent in people who have never married or are divorced than among people who are married. The following social commentator proposes interpretation of mental illness that challenges the notion of individual pathology. Emil Durkheim, 1858-1970. Durkheim's classical study of suicide led him to postulate a societal rather than an individual explanation for this phenomenon. 
He argued that suicide was not an individual act, but that it could be understood in terms of the bonds that exist between the person and society or the regulation of individual by social norms. Durkheim's analysis of suicide statistics found that suicide was more prevalent in groups where the bond between the individual and the group was overly weak or strong. Regulation of individual desires and aspiration by societal norms was either inadequate or excessive. According to Durkheim, there are four types of suicide. Egoistic, where the social bonds of attachment are weak and the individual is less integrated into the social group and therefore not bound by its obligations. For example, a married man. Altruistic, where the social bonds of attachment are overly strong and the individual sense of self is not distinguished from the group. The individual may be driven to suicide by commitment to the group. For example, suicide bombers. Anomic, where regulation of individual's desire and aspiration is not adequate. This can occur in a society undergoing rapid change, which dislocates social norms, as has been the experience of farmers who have had to adjust the change of their economic circumstances as a result of rural economic downturn. Fatalistic, where there is over-regulation by society that renders the sense of powerlessness in the individual and predisposes the person to suicide. For example, death in custody. Thomas Sass, 1920, 2012, 1920, 2012. Since the 1960, prominent psychiatrist Thomas Sass challenged the concept of mental illness, arguing that disease implies a pathology that often cannot be objectively identified. He attacked the biomedical model, claiming that its purpose was to give control over people's lives to psychiatrists and argued that psychiatrists exercise coercive domination in the guise of protecting the public and the mad from their madness. Contrary to the illusion that psychiatry was coping well with the society's vexing problems, Sass claims that social problems were in fact being obfuscated and aggravated by the disease interpretation of psychiatry. Critic of sociological model Sociological model identifies social determinants of health vulnerable populations and health promotion opportunities, as well as biases that influence diagnosis and treatment. It is important to note, however, that although social determinants are associated with better or poorer health outcomes, the relationships are correlational and cannot be assumed to be in themselves causative. Nevertheless, the contribution of population statistics and social demographic data remains significant. By identifying social determinants that are associated with protective factors for mental health and risk factors for mental illness, potential areas for prevention and intervention are thereby identified. For example, the Australian government's Suicide Prevention Plan, Mental Health, Taking Action to Tackle Suicide, was developed in response to the Senate Committee's report. The hidden toll, Suicide in Australia, which identify the risk population groups as indigenous Australians, men, young people, gay, lesbian, bisexual, and intersex communities, those bereaved by suicide, those living with mental health disorders and people living in rural areas. Personality theories and explanations of human behavior. Table 1.2 outlines the key feature of the major biomedical, psychological, and sociological theories that propose explanations of human behavior. These theories inform our understanding of ourselves and others and underpin the intervention for health promotion, health behavior change, and treatments for mental illness. Personality and behavior, nature versus nurture. Who or what is responsible for personality and human development? Heredity or the environment? Philosophers have long debated this issue. Though scientific interest is more recent, dating from the work of Galton. Galton was a 19th century British pioneer in the study of individual differences and is reportedly credited with proposing the immortal phrase nature versus nurture. 
The ensuing debate resulted in a proliferation of philosophical discussion about and scientific investigation into the effects of biological phenomena and inheritance, nature, and the individual's environment and experience in the world. Nurture. Theoretical perspectives on nature versus nurture. The theories discussed in this chapter place varied emphasis on whether hereditary or environmental factors play a more important role in personality development, human behavior, and mental illness. Behavioral and cognitive psychology advocate for the environment and factors external to the individual being more influential, as does the sociological perspective, though for different reasons. The biomedical model argues for a nature explanation, while psychoanalytic theory and humanistic psychology acknowledge the contribution of both. The psychoanalytic concept of the id, for instance, is biological, but it interacts with the environment in personality development. In humanistic psychology, the need to achieve one's potential is considered to be innate, but the eventual outcome is influenced by the person's experience in the world. Nature or Nurture There is an abundance of evidence to support the interactive explanation of nature and nurture, rather than the answer being found in either or proposal. Despite this, some commentator or theorists continue to advocate for the relative importance of one over the other. Notably exponents of the biomedical model for nature and behaviorism for nurture. Evidence to support the genetic or nature position can be found in family, twin, and adoptive studies. Research over the past 20 years demonstrates that human behavior, personality, and mental illness do have a genetic component. Findings from studies into the heritability of intelligence, IQ, offer the most convincing nature evidence. An American, British, and Swedish study of 240 octogenarian twins found the heritability of IQ to be 62%. In the Colorado Adoption Project, a correlation was found between the IQ of adopted adolescents and their birth parents, but no relationship was found between the IQ of adopted adolescents and their adoptive parents. The researchers concluded that the environment in which the young person was reared had little impact on cognitive ability. In the case of schizophrenia, however, heredity accounts for less than 50% of the predictability of the disorder. Genetic inheritance is only a partial influence, with the environment accounting for the rest. Gottesman's research found that even when an identical twin has schizophrenia, the likelihood of the other twin not developing schizophrenia was 52%. In addition, 63% of the people with schizophrenia do not have a first or second degree relative with the condition. It is clearly evident, therefore, that factors in addition to one's genetic inheritance influence whether the disorder manifests. Such factors, it is assumed, can be found in the environment. Gottesman's research assumes that siblings reared together share the same environment. Schaffner recommends caution in presuming this, as different siblings in the same family do not necessarily experience exactly the same environment. Siblings to share many experiences, such as the same parents, social class, and home environment. However, other experiences are unique to the individual and not shared by siblings. This non-shared environment can include such experiences as birth trauma, illness, and different schooling. Significantly, it appears that it is not the non-shared environment that accounts for most of the environmental influence on children's personality and mood, and that behavior is a result of the interplay between the inherited characteristics and the environment rather than either or. Nature and Nurture An individual's personality does not develop without a genetic inheritance. 
nor can it develop in the absence of influences from experience and the environment. How, then, can the nature versus nurture debate be resolved? Gestalt psychology, founded by Fritz Perls, 1893-1970, in the 60s, comprises humanistic and existentialist elements and offers a model for understanding the nature versus nurture debate. That is, to view personality development as a gestalt. There is no exact English equivalent for this German term, but it is loosely translates as a meaningful, organized whole. That is more than the sum of its parts. Consider a cake. For example, flour, eggs, milk, and sugar are its basic ingredients, but the product of Gestalt bears no resemblance to any of the original ingredients. Yet, each of the ingredients is vital to the final product, as is the process of cooking. Leave out the sugar, and it will not taste like a cake. Omit the heating process, and it will not have the texture of a cake. Considering human personality development, as a gestalt means that neither nature nor nurture can be considered as an is can be considered in isolation from the other. The process of the interaction, context in which they interact are significant. Attributing a relative value of one over the other serve no purpose. Both nature and nurture are vital, inseparable, interdependent components of personality and human development that also influence human behavior and health outcomes. Conclusion The theoretical perspectives discussed in this chapter provides complementary, overlapping, and, at times, contradictory theories of human behavior and personality development. Yet, despite individual theories being able to provide plausible explanations for specific human behaviors, no theory alone is sufficient to explain all human behavior or a single behavior in all circumstances. Additionally, the theories must be cautiously when being applied to people from non-Western culture. Additionally, the theories must be used cautiously when being applied to people from non-Western cultures. Some psychological theories offer a nature, others a nurture explanation, and yet other incorporate both. Even when a specific theory provides a convincing evidence to support the nature or nurture explanation, such evidence is generally correlational and therefore cannot be considered to be causative. Consequently, in seeking to identify factors that influence personality development and human behavior, it is evident that the answer will not be found in asking the nature or nurture question, rather in investigating how the nature is nurtured. In conclusion, although psychological theories do have limitations, they nonetheless provide insightful understandings of human behavior and explanations of personality in many contexts. These theories can be used by health professionals to understand the motivations and behavior of the people they care for and to plan appropriate interventions and care. Furthermore, humans are biological beings who exist in a social context, therefore psychological theories must be utilized within a biopsychosocial framework that also acknowledges these other influences. Remember. Psychology is the scientific study of behavior, particularly, but not exclusively, the study of human behavior. Psychological theories offer competing, and at times, complementary explanations for human behavior. Psychological theories are effective in explaining specific behaviors in specific circumstances, but have limitations regarding global explanation for human behavior. Psychological theory underpins therapeutic intervention in healthcare practice. 
Often human behavior can be best understood by utilizing an eclectic, holistic approach, that is, by taking into consideration biomedical, psychological, and sociological factors, a biopsychosocial approach.